Hi, this is Eve. Welcome to my fifth episode redo. It was originally done in several episodes featuring different horrible child killers. The first one and most popular is that of Wesley Allen Dodd, the Vancouver child killer, and the reading of his diary. Wesley Allen Dodd was born on July 3rd, 1961 in Washington. He was the oldest of three children. At the age of 28 years old, he was convicted of murdering three children and molesting an estimated 170 children. He was small in stature and sometimes used a baby voice. He did not fit the profile of the dangerous trench-coated stranger that children are taught to avoid. Like many child molesters, Wesley knew how to gain access to his victims. He befriended children with gifts and games and knew how to coax them into dangerous situations without using force. Wesley Allen Dodd was perhaps one of the most calculating predators to prowl. So, let's get started. What would be your intention if you're forced to live in prison? Do everything I can to escape, and if necessary, kill prison guards on the way out. And I'll go right back to doing what I did before, as soon as I hit the streets. Which is what? Kill kids. Kill and rape kids. Yes. So you should be executed for the safety of others. Yes. There was really never any love in the family at all. Uh, I don't remember ever hearing the words, I love you. I don't remember ever saying them. So I started planning, writing in the diary. I come back thought a lot about, I don't know why God was started to begin with. You know, I'd be watching, watching kids for a few to start Wesley Allen Dodd's story, I must first start it at the end. It was November of 1989 when Wesley went to the Liberty Theater in Washington and bought a movie ticket for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Wesley sat in the back row, but he wasn't planning on watching the movie. Instead, he was systematically scanning the audience with hopes of kidnapping and eventually killing his fourth victim. But luckily to every young boy in the state of Washington, his plans did not turn out the way he wanted, and instead of capturing a fourth victim, it was he who was captured. Wesley watched as a young boy appearing about six years old, walking up the aisle all by himself towards the lobby. Wesley casually got out of his seat, following the child into the restroom. The theater employees were relaxing in the lobby since the pre-movie mad rush was over, and they were startled to hear a child's frantic screams coming from the men's bathroom. The door to the men's bathroom opened, and employees watched as a small, youthful-looking man with dark hair and a thick mustache come out the bathroom door, carrying a shrieking boy over his shoulder, walking towards the exit. The boy was desperately trying to break free. Wesley patted the boy on his back and said to calm down. The employees were not too surprised because this was not the first time that a child had thrown a temper tantrum in the lobby. But this time, something was different. The theater owner later told a newspaper that the little boy was hysterical and screaming so loud that you could hear him for three blocks. The child was crying out for help. The employees ran after Wesley, who hurried it down the dark street to his car, holding the boy tightly. Once at his car, he fumbled with his keys, and the boy was able to break free and run away. He ran as fast as his little legs could go and ran straight into one of the theater owner's legs and wrapped his arms around her tightly. He was saying that the man was going to hurt him. The theater owner and the boy returned to the theater to find his mom. The little boy was a six-year-old named James. Meanwhile, William Ray Graves, the boyfriend of James's mother, heard a commotion after the boy left to use the restroom, and when he heard what happened, he became furious. He would later say there was fire in his eyes. He was so angry. Someone had seen the abductor in a mustard-yellow pinto station wagon. 
So Graves ran outside into the dark streets looking for the car, determined to chase him down on foot. Astonishingly, Wesley's Pinto station wagon was stopped on the street because it stalled and he was stuck. Graves cautiously made his move. He approached the Pinto carefully and, trying to appear calm, asked the driver if he needed help. Wesley nervously glanced at Graves, but he accepted his offer. When he had his chance, Graves grabbed Wesley by the neck and dragged him to the theater. You have just been detained. We are going to get the cops, he said, resisting the urge to hurt the man who tried to take James in the theater lobby. Graves tied Wesley's hands behind his back with a belt and set him down until the police arrived. Wesley stared at the floor and said nothing. The police arrived shortly and made the arrest. So I spoke with someone who lived in the area at this time. And he said that before police arrived, hero William Graves and James's uncle beat the heck out of Wesley, which completely makes more sense than him saying, you have just been detained. It was a six-year-old boy named James and a man named William Ray Graves who brought down the Northwest's most notorious and vicious child killer. James was taught to make a commotion and put up a fight if anyone tried to abduct him. Thanks to them, a countless number of children were saved from being molested or killed, as there is no doubt that Wesley Allen Dodd would continue to hunt, capture, and kill young boys. And with his capture, I can now go to the beginning of the story, and it will end where we started. Wesley began sexually abusing children when he was only 13 years old. As grade school youngsters passed by his house, he stood in the upstairs window naked, hiding his face behind the curtain. Eventually, a child reported the flasher's address to the police who notified Wesley's parents that someone was exposing himself to children from their house. The authorities showed little interest in who it was or prosecuting him. His parents thought it might have been a friend of Wesley's. No parent wants to think that their child would do that. After realizing that exposing himself from his own house would get him in trouble, Wesley took his show on the road, as he called it. He rode his bike around the neighborhood looking for children aged 10 or younger. He would ride by, yell at them, and when he got their attention, he exposed himself. He later said he looked for boys because boys didn't report him as often as girls. Side note... That is true. Many men are raped, but do not report it. Wesley began exposing himself, he later said, because he had hip puberty and wasn't educated about sex. He never claimed to have been sexually abused himself and later blamed his unhappiness as a child on his parents' constant fighting and their lack of emotional support. Wesley's father, Jim Dodd, later told the Organian that he acknowledged his son's sexual deviancy with father-son chats, but mostly avoided talking about it. Despite Wesley's increasing arrests and warnings, he was otherwise well-behaved. He never smoked, drank, or did drugs. When his parents divorced, the exposing escalated to molesting. Wesley described himself as socially isolated, intimidated by girls, and when others began dating and going to high school dances, he stayed home thinking of ways to instigate sexual activity with children. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which classifies and describes mental disorders, pedophilia is one of the behaviors associated with loners who have low self-esteem. They feel sexually inadequate, afraid to risk rejection by their peers, and avoid mature relationships. They feel immature themselves. But don't worry, many people have low self-esteem and are loners, like myself and probably several of you listeners, but it doesn't mean that we are pedophiles, because that's disgusting. Like most child molesters do, Wesley betrayed the trust of children who were close to him. If a sexual predator has access to kids that know and trust him, he will take advantage of their trust. Stranger abductions are usually a last resort. Wesley's first victims were his own cousins, each 14 years old. He molested his own 8-year-old cousin in a closet, her 6-year-old brother later that day, and another male cousin weeks later. He also molested the kids of a woman that his father was dating when his cousins were not available to him. Wesley placed himself in situations where he had to be around children. 
befriended the neighborhood boys and offered to babysit. At age 16, Wesley was asked to fill in for a neighbor's usual babysitter. He did watch them all right and molested the children as they slept. Wesley sought jobs where he'd encounter kids, including becoming a camp counselor. Usually he would trick children into inappropriate contact through fun and games. He dared kids to run around naked and suggested party games like spin the bottle, strip poker, skinny dipping, or truth or dare. He exploited the children's innocence and curiosity and made the molestation seem normal and fun. It wasn't until later that he used force with his victims. He would tell kids that he did things with the other kids and they liked it. He manipulated their uncertainty and nervousness and perhaps their guilt that they had done something wrong. Then he would attempt to neutralize the situation as just two little kids who didn't know better. He tried to convince a confused child that he was teaching him something fun that adults do and that it was perfectly normal. Arrests didn't stop him. At the age of 15, Wesley had already been arrested for exposing himself, but he was not jailed. Instead, the authorities recommended counseling. The arrests accumulated, but Wesley was rarely punished with the appropriate jail time. When the children he regularly molested moved away, Wesley, now 18, was desperate for new victims. He went on the prowl for kids and now realized he would have to be more forceful with children. One incident, he encountered a young boy fishing alone in a wooded area. He asked the boy if he wanted to see something really neat. Once they were isolated, Wesley ordered the boy to undress, but fortunately for the child, another group of kids interrupted them. If he couldn't find a child alone, he would approach a group of children and demand that one of them pull his pants down. Sometimes Wesley went out on bizarre night excursions, rollicking naked at children's playgrounds in the middle of the night. In September of 1981, he joined the United States Navy, but a few weeks before that, he attempted abducting a couple of little girls. They reported him to the police, but once again, he was not arrested, and now I'm just beginning to sound like a broken record. Wesley was stationed at a submarine base in Bangor, Washington, and preyed on the children who lived on the base. He also made excursions to Seattle where he accosted kids in movie theater bathrooms. To get children into secluded areas, he would act like he needed help getting something. But once alone and secluded with a child, he ordered the child to pull down his pants. He began to use money as a lure. He discovered that the arcade was a good place to find kids who wished they had more money. He gave them quarters for each of his demands. At one point, he was arrested for offering some boys $50 each to go to a motel and play strip poker with him. But after he admitted to the police that he planned on molesting the boys, the charges were dropped. Did the authorities think that him admitting to it was punishment enough? Did they not see his previous records? Eventually, Wesley was arrested and received a general discharge from the Navy. He was apprehended after approaching a young boy and found guilty of attempted indecent liberties for this. He served 19 days in jail and was ordered again to get counseling, but Wesley was relentless. No amount of counseling kept him from pursuing children. In May 1984, police arrested him for molesting a 10-year-old boy. Although his sentence should have kept him off the streets, the judge, for reasons unknown, allowed Wesley to stay out of jail, giving him a suspended one-year sentence, attend counseling, and be an upstanding citizen. Again, I sound like a broken record. During this period, he was arrested twice for driving with a suspended license, which would not be the behavior of an upstanding citizen, but he was not brought back to jail. Again, why? He remained free to stalk kids and continued doing so because obviously they just kept letting him get away with it each time. And I don't understand. I think sometimes maybe at that time... It was easier for the authorities to kind of look the other way and hope someone else will deal with it. Every decision he made involved his access to children. He chose an apartment building with lots of kids, took jobs at fast food restaurants, convenience stores, and charity truck routes where he could pick up donations from houses. 
Wesley later admitted to always watching and staying alert for opportunities, which is a strong behavior in sexual predators. On his truck route, he was oftentimes invited into houses with children. Changing a baby's diaper was enough to arouse him to molestation. So does that mean like on a truck route, he'd go into a house and there would be a busy mom with her children and had donations to give and she had a crying baby whose diaper needed changed and nice Wesley offered to change the baby's diaper and help her out. That's kind of what I'm thinking happened. On his route, if he saw a kid he liked, he wrote down the address with plans to return later in his own car, hoping to catch the child alone. He would make note of any isolated areas he encountered and mark them on a map. Once he took a co-worker's son fishing for the boy's birthday, and guess what Wesley gave him as a present? The emotional and physical trauma of sexual abuse. He repeatedly molested the neighbor's two- and four-year-old kids, but the mother didn't want to traumatize the boys further by pressing charges. And once again, I always say, child molesters are your Boy Scout leaders, your neighbor, your friend, your youth pastors, youth volunteers. See, the thing is, I don't even like watching my own kids, let alone volunteering to watch someone else's kids. So if someone actually wants to spend more time with your kids than you do, I would definitely question it. In 1986, at the age of 25, Wesley moved to Seattle. He felt invincible having sexually assaulted at least 30 kids at this point. When he got to Seattle, he learned that he was less likely to be reported for molestation than for just an attempt. My guess is, is that he would make the kid feel guilty or, like as previously said, assaults on boys and men aren't reported as often. So that is probably why once the actual molesting was done, they didn't want to even say anything. He later wrote, I decided that from now on, I would be a little more forceful. I would no longer accept no as an answer to my requests. He chose the most vulnerable children, including a roommate's two-year-old son who was partially deaf and could not yet talk. The boy resisted, so Wesley tied his hands with the bathrobe tie. The idea of force was exciting. He said despite the ongoing counseling sessions, he had no intention of controlling his pedophilic urges. In fact, Wesley began to fantasize about killing his victims. He later said, The more I thought about it, the more exciting the idea of murder sounded. I planned many ways to kill a boy. Then I started thinking of torture, castration, and even cannibalism. But he also later claimed that he decided to murder to keep from going to jail. But the latter doesn't seem plausible as he was hardly prosecuted for any of his past crimes. And Wesley would later rant about how easy it was to manipulate the justice system and stay out of jail. The reason Wesley Allen Dodd wanted to kill children was because he was a sexual sadist stimulated by his control over their suffering and death. In 1987, Wesley chose the first child he would murder, an eight-year-old boy he met while working as a security guard for a construction site. On his day off, he drove to where the boy lived, hoping to lure him into one of the vacant buildings nearby and then take him into an isolated wooded area where he would kill him. But the kid sensed that something wasn't right. After Wesley asked him to help find a lost little boy, the eight-year-old said that he was going home to get some toys for the lost little boy and promised that he'd be right back. Instead, he stayed inside. That is one very smart kid, and always trust your instincts. His mother called the police, and Wesley received, guess what, another light sentence. One district attorney said that they prosecuted the case to the full extent that they were able to. Essentially, he tried to get the boy to go with him, but the boy refused, so nothing happened that they could use. Prosecutors tried to invoke Wesley's history, which is about time, as a sexual predator to convict him for a longer sentence of five to six years in jail, but the judge reduced the charge and he only served 118 days in jail, with one year probation. This was a very light sentence, especially since he admitted his intention was to kill the boy. He admitted this. 
He even said that he was predatory and uncontrollable. Psychologist Kenneth Von Cleve saw Wesley as a serious danger. He said Mr. Dodd's history of deviant assaults on minors is the most extensive I have ever encountered in an offender of his age. He wrote and concluded that Dodd was an extremely high risk for future reoffense. Dr. Von Cleve attempted to get Wesley's conviction upgraded to a felony, which would have meant more aggressive treatment. Yet he did not see him capable of violence. He said Dodd was like a child, and when he talked about the offenses, he did it in baby talk. He wanted to fit right in with the kids, but didn't want to hurt them. Clearly he was wrong, since Dodd admitted that he wanted to kill a kid. However, psychopaths are good at tricking specialists. The serial killer Edmund Kemper is one such example. After killing his grandparents, he tricked specialists into thinking that he was rehabilitated. So this is not uncommon. The following year, just months before the murders began, Wesley briefly got together with an old girlfriend who had brought with her a baby. She claimed it was his, but after only five days together in a motel, she left. So who knows what happened in those five days, but I have no doubt that that baby was molested. He then moved to Vancouver. He also started a diary about his thoughts and excursions, which I will read to you on the next episode. In the fall of 1989, Dodd, who had just moved to Vancouver and was very desperate to find children, later said, On Labor Day, I was tired from moving and didn't have a TV or anything, so I started thinking about molesting, like before. Wesley found a popular place for kids, the David Douglas Park in Vancouver, and decided this would be his new hunting grounds. David Douglas Park was located about a mile from his new apartment, and I bet that was a factor in choosing to live at that apartment complex. He walked the dirt paths in the wooded park looking for isolated areas behind the shrubs where kids might curiously wander into. In his diary, he wrote that David Douglas Park would be a good place for rape and murder, or kidnapping rape and murder. He thought it was just an all-around good hunting ground. On Saturday, September 2nd, Labor Day weekend, Wesley positioned himself near the trail entrance of the park, waiting for an opportunity to take a child. He saw three boys, but didn't make a move. This incident, however, sparked violent fantasies. The next morning, Wesley wrote in his diary his plans. If I could get it home, I will have more time for various types of rapes, rather than just one quickie before murder. Like most sociopaths, he depersonalized his targeted victims, in this instance, referring to a child as it. In the afternoon, he returned home for lunch, discouraged that he had not found a child. Tomorrow, he thought he would pack a lunch so that he doesn't miss any opportunities. He considered attacking a group of children and fantasized how he could attack. With groups of three, he could kill the oldest quickly and then take his time with the younger victims. By Monday, he was desperate. He would have to be prepared to overtake two or more at once. He gathered his hunting gear, which included a fish fillet knife bandaged to his ankle and shoestrings to tie up his victim. As in the previous two days, something always seemed to thwart him. A parent following his child, a kid's sudden and spontaneous turn down another path away from Wesley, or just potential witnesses. Wesley grew increasingly frustrated as his sick fantasies inflamed with the passing of each child who was under someone's watch. He became agitated and willing to take bigger risks. He went home and wrote in his diary. Then, at 6.15 in the evening, he returned to the park and paced restlessly up the path. In the early evening, William Near, aged 10, and his brother Cole Near, aged 11, raced their bikes through David Douglas Park on their way home. They were already late for dinner, so they took the shortcut through the park. Billy and Cole had spent the afternoon on the golf course scooping up and returning lost balls for reward money. As they rode down the dirt path, they were stopped by Wesley blocking the way. And unlike most of the other times, no one else was around. Wesley told Billy and Cole to get off their bikes. I want you to come with me. When Billy asked why, Wesley's response was, because I told you to. Somehow, Wesley exerted control over the two boys and they did what he said. Two teenagers passed them, and Wesley told the brothers to be quiet. He led them off the trail and told them to lay their bikes where they could no longer be visible from the path. They continued through a bramble to an isolated spot. Wesley ordered Billy and Cole to stand with their backs to each other, and he tied their wrists together with shoelaces. 
Why? asked Cole over and over. Wesley said that one of them was going to have to pull down his pants. The boys were terrified and confused. Cole asked, will it hurt? Wesley said no. Cole agreed to do it. Perhaps out of fear or the desire to protect his younger brother. I'm sure so many thoughts were going through their minds, and they probably thought perhaps it would be over soon and they could go home. Why are you doing this to us? asked Cole. The boys grew increasingly panicked as Wesley began molesting them, but he promised to let them go. Billy began to cry when Dodd turned his attentions to him. Wesley wanted to molest the younger Billy, but he was crying too hard. Wesley then forced the boys onto their knees, took out his knife, and cut apart the shoestrings that connected the brothers. Billy asked if he could go home and tell their father that he would be late. Wesley said no, that he was almost done. He ordered Billy to sit while he molested Cole. There's just one more thing, said Wesley, with his knife in his hands. The boys sobbed and pleaded, but their cries meant nothing. Wesley stabbed Billy in the stomach and then attacked Cole as he jumped up, catching him in the side with his knife. But Billy was able to run off toward a busy street. Panicked, Wesley looked down to see Cole on the ground, struggling. As Cole tried to defend himself, Wesley stabbed him two more times until he stopped moving. He then ran after Billy. Wesley caught Billy before he made it to the road and wrapped his hand around the little boy's arm furiously. "'I'm sorry, I'm sorry,' sobbed Billy." Wesley then stabbed the ten-year-old on the side and shoulder and ran back into the woods. He left both Cole and Billy bleeding to death among the shrubs. Wesley returned to make sure Cole was dead and to retrieve any potential evidence. He had already pocketed the shoelaces and then calmly walked away, hiding his bloody hand in his pocket. Billy, barely alive, was quickly discovered. At first, authorities thought it was a hit-and-run accident, but the boy did not live to tell them what happened. It would soon be evident that the boy had been viciously attacked. The homicide investigators arrived at the hospital where Billy, who was not yet identified and just called it Junior Doe, later died. In the meantime, Billy and Cole's father was worried. He searched the neighborhoods and then called the police to report that his two sons had not come home. Then it occurred to the investigators that they had better search the park for another victim, the brother of Junior Doe, now identified as Billy Near. By now, night had fallen. They explored the dirt paths and shrubs with their flashlights. It wasn't until 2 a.m. that they found Cole Near, where Wesley had left him. The parents in Vancouver were horrified. They banded together and watched over parks and paths that kids used for schools, and children were instructed to avoid isolated areas. Although a few witnesses came forward describing a suspicious man lurking in David Douglas Park the day that the Near brothers were killed, the police had few leads. Sketches of possible suspects circulated the community, but to no avail. The murders frightened the community because of the randomness. Wesley had been frustrated by the attack because he didn't get to do the things he fantasized doing to his victims. He went to work, but kept to himself, afraid that someone might make a connection between the police artist rendering of the suspect and him. He worked at Pack Paper as a shipping clerk. Co-workers later said they thought there was something odd about him. He told his co-workers that he was employed by the Clark County Sheriff's Office to stand on the corner and watch children. He also claimed that he was divorced and was upset because his infant child had just died of crib death. Other than his weird remarks, no one suspected the clean-shaven young man to think of anything deadly. They thought he was bright, meticulous, and could have easily advanced his position at the company, but of course he did not care about that. He only thought of his secret vocation of preying on children and now killing them. Wesley would just sit at home alone in his room, and he clipped articles and wrote sadistic fantasies in his diary. He was excited by thoughts of how Cole Near looked as he lay dying covered with blood. Right up until the moment I did it, I wasn't absolutely sure I could do it or not, Wesley later said on killing Cole and Billy. That might have been part of what made the first instance so exciting. He decided that he got more of a high out of killing than molesting. Wesley listed ways to kill children, including fast ways such as stabbing, and slower, more painful deaths, including starvation and bleeding to death. The 20 minutes he had with the Near Brothers was not enough. The next victim he wanted to keep indefinitely. Rape and murder now bored him. Wesley now fantasized about experiments he wanted to perform on his victims. 
In one of his many letters written after capture, Wesley questioned his cannibal fantasies at the time. Why? I don't know. I wanted to eat the genitals. Dead children would be a cheap way to feed my slaves, if I ever had any. He planned to cut a boy's genitals off and let him slowly bleed to death or keep him alive and make him watch as he cooked the boy's genitals, forcing him to eat some of it. He would serve a mystery vegetable with the testicles from other boys, and after revealing what the vegetable was, he would tell the kid that they were next. I was mainly interested in eating the genitals while kids watched. I was going to do this as a form of torture more than anything else. Wesley's plans now are beyond psychopathic. Many sexual murderers thrive on fantasies to satisfy their sadistic impulses, but the more they fantasize, the more they lose touch with reality, and the more they distance themselves from those who might be able to help pull them back. Toward the end of October, Wesley plotted his next attack. He was frightened that he would be arrested for the murders of Billy and Cole, but when he realized that the police didn't have any solid clues, he began to think about killing again. He decided that Saturday afternoons after work was the best time to find a boy. Now he just needed to determine where. He drove to Portland, Oregon, just over the bridge from Vancouver, and stopped at Oak Park. Oak Park was a popular place and crowded with kids. He approached a little boy who was waiting for a ride called the Spider and asked him if he wanted to see something interesting. But the child's father showed up and Wesley scurried away. He left Oak Park and drove through southeast Portland searching for playgrounds. He passed by Richmond School and decided to try back later. It was getting too dark and kids were not around. Some kids he had spotted quickly disappeared. Wesley went to the movies with the intent of abducting a child in the restroom. He chose The Bear, a family movie, and sat in the back row, but missed his opportunities. With his frustration growing out of control, Wesley was determined to kidnap a child the next day. On Sunday, October 29th, Justin Izelli and his little brother Lee Izelli told their father that they were going to the school ground park along with another friend. It was a sunny day and their father Robert Izelli thought it would be okay as the boys had been there a couple of times before. Although the neighborhood was safe, he told his sons to stay together and watch out for strangers. That same morning, Wesley drove to the Richmond school playground and waited. Some older kids were playing football while another watched. Then Wesley spotted four-year-old Lee by himself playing atop a concrete structure with a slide that the kids called the volcano. Lee slid down to the base. Wesley approached him and smiled, saying, Hi, how are you doing? Lee smiled back and said, Hi. Wesley asked, Would you like to have fun and make some money? The boy seemed frightened and hesitated, looking around, and then shook his head no. But Wesley insisted and offered his hand, and Lee, perhaps in an automatic response, took Wesley's hand and was led to his car, and that is when Lee started to resist. Sensing the boy's fear, Wesley assured him that it was okay because his father sent him to go get him. But when Wesley placed him in the car and drove off, the boy said, I live the other way. Wesley said that we're just going to my house to play some games. Just do what I tell of you, and I promise I won't hurt you, but you have to be quiet when we get there. My landlady doesn't like little kids. But Lee was worried that his brother was going to miss him, and Wesley smoothed that out, saying that they would have fun, and his brother was having fun, too. Unfortunately, Wesley had years of experience in knowing what to say to kids to gain their trust and what to say to keep them calm and quiet. Once Wesley arrived home, his landlord wasn't there, and it seemed that no one saw him arrive with Lee. At the same time that Wesley was arriving at his apartment in Vancouver, a distraught Robert Zelli was calling the police to report that his son was missing. His older boy had returned home frantic because he couldn't find Lee anywhere. One minute Lee was playing on the volcano, and the next he disappeared. Robert told the police that Lee's the kind of kid who doesn't take off, but he does get sidetracked easily. Inside, Wesley took some pictures of Lee with his Polaroid camera, then told Lee to get undressed and tied him to the bed with ropes. He took more pictures, untied the boy, and then molested him. 
Afterwards, Lee watched cartoons on the television while Wesley recorded the events in his diary. He asked Lee if he wanted to spend the night with him. No, the boy said. My brother might miss me. But Wesley reassured him that his brother is still having a good time, and then he took Lee to Kmart to buy him a toy, and at Kmart, the boy began to cry. A store employee approached them concerned, but Wesley explained that it was okay. He was just babysitting his nephew who wanted to go home. Afterwards, they went to McDonald's in Vancouver, only blocks away from where Cole and Billy near were killed. Once back at the apartment, Wesley wrote in his diary as Lee played with his new toy. He suspects nothing now. We'll probably wait until morning to kill him. That way, his body will be fairly fresh for experiments after work. I'll suffocate him in his sleep when I wake up for work, if I sleep. Wesley continued to molest the little boy through the night, taking breaks to record more notes in his diary. He fantasized about how he would kill the child and how he would hide him while he was at work. At one point, he woke Lee up and whispered, I'm going to kill you in the morning. No, you're not, cried Lee. Wesley then calmed Lee down and told him that he wouldn't kill him, and eventually Lee fell back asleep. But in the early morning, Wesley strangled the sleeping boy. He struggled as hard as he could against the attack. After cruelly reviving the child, Wesley strangled Lee with the rope and hung him in his crowded closet so he could take pictures. He shoved aside hangers and jackets to make room. Those who saw the Polaroids of Lee Azelli's sufferings will never forget the depth of Wesley Dodd's cruel and cold-blooded depravity. Wesley hid Lee's little body in the closet behind some blankets and pillows, just in case his landlady came in. It was time to get to work, and Wesley didn't want to be late. When Wesley returned home from work, he poured more into his obsessive diary. He would now have to get some bags to hide Lee. Then he wrote, I'll figure out a place to dump the garbage. Again, Lee was not a human to him at all. He drove to a dock near the packed paper plant and discarded Lee in the brush near Vancouver Lake in plain sight without the slightest bit of remorse. Side note, no remorse was obvious because usually when there is remorse, the killer will cover the body or face up with something. He burned the child's clothing in a barrel in the backyard, except for Lee's little Ghostbusters underwear, which he stashed away in a briefcase under his bed. A few days after Lee was missing, Robert Zilli made a heartbreaking comment to the media, saying that he hoped that an adult who was lonely just wanted company of a little boy and abducted Lee, and that there are probably a lot of people out there that are lonely, and maybe someone who never had a child or never got to dress up for Halloween or never got presents at Christmas, maybe it's something like that, and, and he could just drop him off at a store or street corner. And that statement... On the morning of November 1st, 1989, a pheasant hunter discovered Lee at Vancouver Lake. The investigators were shocked and dismayed to see the little boy dumped alongside some garbage so ruthlessly discarded. One sheriff later said, what could a four-year-old do to make someone kill him? Dr. Ronald Turco prepared a psychological profile of the killer. He would be 25 to 35 years old, kicked out of the military if he served, and he would be a loner. He probably kept photos of his victims and a diary of his offenses, including clipped articles and child pornography. The killer probably chose boys because he saw girls as defective. Although this profile accurately described Wesley Allen Dodd, it was not enough to conjure up a definitive suspect. Composite sketches were released and hundreds of calls came in from people who thought they had seen Lee with someone. There were no solid leads. Investigators attended Lee's funeral hoping to spot the killer, but Wesley knew to stay away. He sat in his room alone with his diary and built a torture rack out of boards and ropes intended for his next victim. He decided that his best chance to find another child would be at the movies. He checked the listings for family features. After a few attempts, there was success, but not for Dodd. This time, Wesley Allen Dodd would be captured thanks to a brave six-year-old boy named James and a courageous man named William Ray Graves. This monster was finally caught, and this brings us back to the beginning of the story when Wesley was arrested. When Wesley was arrested, he was visibly nervous as detectives from both Washington and Oregon interrogated him. His record revealed the litany of crimes against children, the most serious being an attempted abduction in Seattle in 1987. More importantly, they realized that their suspect lived a short distance from where Cole and Billy were killed and worked close to where Lee Azelli's body was found. When questioned about the incident at the New Liberty Theater, 
Wesley tried to convince the detectives that he intended only to molest the boy in the restroom. He admitted to his history of molestations, but left out the murders. Eventually, Wesley confessed that he had killed Billy and Cole Near and Lee Azelli, and then went into graphic detail. He claimed that he had to kill the Near brothers so that they wouldn't identify him, and when Cole pulled his pants down, he knew he wouldn't be able to let them go. Wesley then recounted how he coaxed Lee into his car and brought him home where he molested and killed him. Detectives were disgusted by Wesley's admissions, but were even more disturbed by the fact that he seemed to enjoy reliving the events. He then told them about the briefcase under the bed where he hid his diaries, his photo albums, and Lee's underwear. As investigators searched his apartment, they found belts, exacto knives, and ropes around the bed's headboard and footboard, four volumes of parent-child books, and a copy of the New Testament with the word Satan Lives scribbled inside. They also found Wesley's homemade torture rack, which luckily had not yet been used. But the most incriminating discovery was the briefcase under the bed. The first thing investigators noticed when they unlatched the briefcase was Lee's folded Ghostbusters underwear. They found his diaries, which they painstakingly recounted the assault and plan for future murders. Wesley had neatly organized the articles pertaining to the Near and Izelli cases and had systematically arranged his notes on the crimes divided into two separate envelopes titled Incident 1, Incident 2, and Incident 3. A photo album with the words family memories on the cover functioned as Wesley's pornographic collection, which included images of Christ as a baby. It also contained advertising with images of children in underwear. There were Polaroids of Wesley naked, Wesley assaulting Lee, and pictures taken of Lee after he died, including the one of the little boy hanging in the closet. Wesley was charged with first-degree murder in the deaths of Billy and Cole Near and Lee Azilli, as well as the attempted kidnapping in the New Liberty Theater. Initially, Wesley pleaded not guilty, but in January 1990, against his attorney's wishes, he changed his plea to guilty on all counts. Later that year, he stood before a Clark County judge and read a statement indicting himself on all charges. Wesley admitted that his crimes, including murder, were premeditated. There would be no trial to determine his guilt, but a jury would have to decide whether or not to give him the death penalty. Look at what Mr. Dodd liked to do in his free time, said Prosecutor Roger Bennett to the jury. Plan child murders, commit child murders, relive fantasies about child murders, and write about them. With life parole, two of those things are still available to him. The jury of six men and six women listened with disbelief, disgust, and grief as they were read sections from Dodd's diary and saw the photos implicating Dodd's brutalities against Lee Zelli. One of the jurors nearly passed out as he listened to parts of the diary read out loud. They also heard Wesley's detailed plans for his future victims, which included mutilation and dismemberment. Wesley's defense did not call any witnesses, nor did they present any evidence during the trial. During the trial, Wesley sat quietly stone-faced. He later told the Organian that he was bored by the testimony. He said, I've heard it so many times now, it's kind of old, really. Prosecutors asked for the death penalty, and on Saturday, July 15, 1990, the jury agreed that Wesley should die for his crimes. William Ray Graves, who apprehended Wesley outside the New Liberty Theater, said that the man doesn't deserve to live, not someone who does that to babies. There's nothing more precious than them little guys. Wesley did not offer any mitigating evidence during the penalty phase because, in my mind, that's just an excuse and I don't want to make any excuses, he told the court. I do not blame the criminal justice system for anything, but the system does not work and I can tell them why. He said it doesn't really matter why the crimes happen. I should be punished to the full extent of the law as should all sex offenders and murderers. Wesley Dodd stated that if his death would bring relief to victims' families, that he should die as soon as possible. After this sentence, Wesley insisted that hanging was the appropriate means of execution and that he did not want his death delayed by appeals. Wesley said that he must be executed before he has an opportunity to escape or kill someone within the prison. He further said, if I do escape, I promise you, I will kill 
and rape and enjoy every minute of it. He wanted to hang, he said, because that's the way Lee Azili died. The execution date for January 5th, 1993 in Walla Walla, Washington. The ACLU fought to keep him off the gallows, arguing that the death, especially hanging, was cruel and unusual punishment. But I'm pretty sure what Wesley did to those boys would qualify as even crueler. But luckily, Washington's justice system prevailed and his execution date was moved closer. As his execution date approached, Wesley professed remorse for what he had done. I have confessed all my sins, he told a reporter in his interview. I believe what the Bible teaches. I'll go to heaven. I have doubts, but I'd really like to believe that I would be able to get up there to the three little boys and give them a hug and tell them how sorry I was and be able to love them with real true love and have no desire to hurt them in any way. I bet him saying that ticked the parents off. Five minutes after 12 a.m. on January 5th, Wesley Allen Dodd was executed by hanging. He was the first inmate to die at the gallows since 1965. However, this story is not yet over. I have the entirety of Wesley Allen Dodd's diary, and I will read it to you on the next episode. Until then, keep an eye on your children and have a good evening.